Th thank you, John. And let me start by saying that since Gilead is the lead development partner for Slatravir and Acapavir, all questions about that will be answered by Cal. <laughs> now, now I'll, I'll come back to, to, to the issue of the, of the dosing and some thoughts that I have about it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again, John, for having invited me, uh, you know, coming to Rome. Uh, what, what a sacrifice, right? It's, it's great to be here, and, and it's great to see you all face to face. So uh, what I'll do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is go over what we have been working on over the last year since, since I saw you back in Paris. And of course, at the time, the big question was, what is going to happen to Islatravir? Um, the, the one general type uh, slide that I'll show is this one that touches upon some of the issues that Harmony and Cal have already brought up, and that is that despite the fact that we have made so many advances in the treatment and prevention of HIV, uh, there still are very many unmet uh, needs. Uh, we need to work on reducing pill fatigue. We need to work on toxicities that are becoming apparent. Uh, there's this issue of weight gain that we have to deal with, some metabolic disturbances, perhaps even some cardiovascular events. We realize that stigma continues to be a huge thing in, in this field, despite all the advances that have been made. Uh, we realize that some patients fail therapy and need to have their resistant virus resuppressed. Uh, we realize that some individuals have problems with adherence, challenges to adherence, and, and that all of these issues are particularly exacerbated in certain patient populations. So with this in mind, um, about a year and a half ago, we were at a point in our HIV program where we were extremely excited about being able to bring to the clinic a holistic program based on a novel molecule that uh, would do a lot of things for us. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a slatravir. It has picomolar potency, like the lenacapavir that Cal talked about a moment ago. It has an intracellular half-life of about 190 hours, which is about eight days. Um, it has a unique resistance profile in that the M184V mutation that we know so well reduces susceptibility to it, but only about fivefold. And with the doses we were planning on using, these, um, th this resistance was not, we, we did not feel was going to be an issue. So Islatravir was going to allow us to span the whole spectrum of treatment and prevention, all the way from a, from a daily pill, um, and in this case it was an Islatravir deriving combination, to at the time a once weekly pill with Islatravir and a new non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that we have been developing. Um, it is MK8507. I don't have in here the Islatravir and Acapavir combination because, of course, that is uh, a Gilead development program. We had the ability to give Islatravir as a once monthly pill for prevention of HIV. There was great excitement uh, about that. And then we also have the possibility of putting Islatravir into a polymer implant that we know very well that um, Merck acquired when it merged with Sharing Plow that has been used for contraception in women. Um, so it's a well-studied technology and in, in theory it would have allowed us to give to put the implant in for one whole year for prevention, essentially like a, like a vaccine, right, that you would have to replace every year. But what happened was at the end of 2021, we came to realize that there were some lymphocyte decreases throughout the Islatravir program. This first came to light during our normal monitoring of the, of the uh, results that were coming in for patients. We convened our data monitoring committees. They corroborated what we thought we had seen. Of course, they were unblinded to the data. And long story short, it was seen across all programs. What you have up on screen are three different graphs showing lymphocyte decreases for the monthly 60 milligram PrEP program. These decreases range according to the time span, be it three months or six months, all the way from seven to 21%. Uh, there were decreases in the weekly 20 milligram program of the Islatravir MK8507, not Islatravir and Acapavir combination, and these decreases seemed to be at the time um, correlated with the dose of MK8507 that was being used. It was the same dose of 20 milligrams of Islatravir in the three 
in the three doses we were exploring with 8507 of either 100 or 200 or 400 milligrams. We're not so sure anymore that there really was an association with 8507. This may have been an incidental finding, but we're still working on trying to identify what happened there. And then on our Dorari and Islatravir daily program, where the dose of Islatravir was 0.75 milligrams, there were also slight decreases. Um, what you see up on screen is the switch studies. Um, and, and what is in green is the decreases with Islatravir. What is in or, um, purple uh, are the increases with the comparator drugs in, in lymphocyte counts. And uh, that caused us to put the program on pause. The lymphocyte decreases were for all classes of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, CD4, CD8, and natural killer cells. Not one class more than um, any other, not one cell type. So the, the program was pretty comprehensive. This is only a partial list. There are a couple of studies that are not in there, a pediatric study, a highly treatment experienced patient study. But in short, we, we went with a fine tooth comb over what had been happening with at least three major phase two and phase three PrEP programs. The first one, um, a dose ranging study of either 60 or 120 milligrams once a month. And then the two phase uh, three programs, uh, pro, uh, protocol 22 and protocol 24, in cisgender women and cisgender men and transgender women respectively at 60 milligrams a month. Initially, we had thought we would be enrolling thousands of patients into each one of those. At the end of the day, the numbers were much smaller because the programs were put on hold. And then we had our extensive HIV treatment program. We had two phase two studies, the uh, protocol 13, which was this combination of Islatravir with uh, MK8507 as a weekly therapy. We had the protocol 11, which was a dose ranging study with uh, daily Islatravir. And I'll come back to that one because that program became really important in the long run. And in fact, it is the program, the protocol, that has allowed us to move forward with a new dose of Islatravir. And then in the middle, we had two uh, programs in switch 17 and 18, in addition to which we had a naive uh, program that uh, I'm not going to go over. So when we share this with regulatory authorities around the world and with external advisors, some of whom, in fact, are sitting in this room, um, and we also had our own internal brainstorming, we came to realize that there were three things that we needed to do. The first one was we needed to characterize the safety findings we had had. And there has been a lot of work and a lot of progress on this. We have come to understand that the magnitude of the decrease in lymphocyte uh, counts is exposure dependent. So that lower exposure to Islatravir ought to reduce or perhaps even eliminate the likelihood that there will be decreases in lymphocytes. We have come to understand that other cell lines, certainly neutrophils, um, macrophages, certainly white blood cells, red blood, um, sorry, red blood cells, platelets are not affected by this. We have also um, ascertained that once you stop dosing, the effect goes away. And finally, and, 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 and returns to its baseline, and, and we are pretty certain that there was no clinical impact. There were no clinical consequences. We did not see an increase in opportunistic infections or any kind of infection for that matter in our development program. So where does all this come from, what, what I just stated? Here we have uh, what happened in our PrEP program of monthly Islatravir once we stopped dosing at month three. You can see how in, with the green line, there were decreases in lymphocyte counts, total lymphocyte counts, for the patients, for the participants who had received Islatravir. Mind you, there were also decreases for the patients who were receiving either Descovy or Truvada. These are normal fluctuations in, in, in lymphocyte counts. But what you can then see is that over the next 11 months, there's a gradual recovery of the lymphocyte counts for the patients who stopped the, um, the Islatravir. In the weekly program, where we were dosing 20 milligrams of Islatravir along with MK8507, you can see how at around week eight is when you start to see a drop from baseline, reaches its nadir at around week 24 when we stop dosing, 
and then there's a gradual recovery over the next few months, spanning out to 24 weeks in this case, or around, around six months. And lastly, in the daily program, and these were switch studies, what you can see is how for the patients who either stayed on their base on ART, in the left-hand panel, pro, uh, protocol 17, or who stayed on Big Tarby in protocol 18 on the right, there's an increase in CD4 cell counts, but, uh, so, sorry, lymphocytes, but CD4 tracks this. Whereas for the patients on the rarinus latrovir, there's a gradual decrease that seems to stabilize somewhere between week 48 and week 72. And then perhaps, well, it either stays flat or perhaps there's a bit of more recovery, but there certainly is no further decrease. The difference between this slide and the prior two slides is that in the, in the prior two, therapy was stopped. But in this one, therapy was continued under very close supervision, under institution of several different discontinuation rules. So, so to recap then, when you stop therapy with Islatravir at these doses, there's a gradual recovery back to baseline of lymphocytes. And when you continue therapy at this lower daily dose, it stabilizes. And there's no loss of efficacy. And in fact, at CROI this year, we shared data from protocols 17 and 18, showing that in fact, the primary endpoint of these two studies had been met. The primary endpoint being achieving a viral suppression that was not inferior to the comparator regimens, be they just uh, whatever was being used in protocol 17 on the left, or Big Tarby, specifically the panel on the right. Um, and there, there were no instances in the patients who did fail the rarinus latrovir therapy, or for that matter, in the patients who failed Bictarvi specifically, there were no instances of selection of genotypic or phenotypic resistance to any of the components of the regimen. The second big thing that we had to do was we had to understand what was happening. And I don't have slides to show this. They were too complicated and the time is too limited. But what we have sorted out is that these decreases in lymphocytes are most, are, we are certain, are brought about because of the accumulation of the Islatravir triphosphate that leads to apoptosis. Um, and uh, that's what happens. The exact mechanism by which it leads to apoptosis, we are st still trying to sort out. But we are very confident, uh, because this question comes up all the time, that this is not mitochondrial toxicity. Certainly not mitochondrial toxicity like we used to see many years ago, which of course we all saw, and, and you know it's quite different, right? There were never decreases in, in lymphocyte counts. People would have fat wasting, they would have peripheral neuropathy, they would have pancreatitis, hepatitis, but not this kind of, of uh, hematologic finding. Um, and lastly, it became evident that for the program to be able to move forward, we needed to identify new doses. So we have spent a lot of time and effort in coming up with exposure response models to predict what's going to happen with lymphocyte counts. Our teams have identified doses for the daily and the weekly program, and I'll talk about this in a moment, that are not expected to be associated with decreases in lymphocyte effects but will, would still be able to suppress the virus adequately. The one thing we have not been able to do is find a monthly dose for Islatravir that would be useful for PrEP. So the monthly PrEP program with Islatravir has been um, abandoned, has been discontinued. And I had mentioned this study before. This was protocol 11, which was a dose ranging study. And in a way, this study is the one that really has had the greatest impact on us being able to move the program forward. What we did at the time was we took individuals who were on an antiretroviral regimen and we switched them to either those three or our Doravarine TDF3TC regimen in, in purple, <coughs> or one of three doses of Islatravir, 0.25 milligrams, 0.75, or 2.25. At the time, of course, we weren't aware that there would be issues with lymphocytes, so we weren't paying much attention to this other than are the, are the lymphocytes okay? In retrospect, after all these issues became apparent, we went back to, to protocol 11, took a more detailed look at 
lymphocytes. And what you can see over here is that there seems to be that same dose dependency effect on lymphocytes. So that the patients, the participants whose lymphocytes are the highest and in fact matching the behavior of the Dostrigo patients are the individuals on the lowest dose of Islatavir at 0.25 milligrams. 0.75 is a little lower, 2.25 milligrams is the lowest. So based on this is that we decided that we would go forward with 0.25 milligrams. And some of you would naturally be asking at this point, why did you not go with 0.25 right from the start? Two reasons, three reasons. Um, first is that with, when you give 0.75 milligrams as a daily dose, on day one, you achieve the amount of islatravi that you need to achieve in order to suppress 100% of wild type strains. If you give 0.25, it takes about three to four days to achieve it in 100% of patients. So at the time when we chose the 0.75, it seemed like a good idea to achieve maximal efficacy on day one. Uh, the second reason for doing this is that by giving these doses, we had more of a buffer when it came to missed doses, which of course is, is a concern. Uh, and the third reason, why was the third reason? I'm struggling. It'll come back eventually. But anyway, that was the, the rash. Oh, yeah, the third reason was that with the levels we achieve on day one, we also uh, achieve complete suppression of M184V virus. And with 0.25, we may not be able to achieve that in 100% of patients. So that was also a critical consideration. Um, and mind you, it's not that the 0.25 milligram dose is less effective. What you have up on screen are the viral suppression rates through week 48 of the three doses that, uh, of the three doses of Islatravir compared to Dostrigo that we studied in protocol 11. And I think it's pretty obvious that the doses are as effective as Dostrigo. Uh, that um, lower rate of suppression with 2.25 is probably just a function of small numbers and it's not statistically significant. So we're pretty confident, as I said before, that with this new dose of Islatravir, we will maintain efficacy and, as the prior, slow, uh, prior slide showed, most likely not um, suppress in any way lymphocytes. So, with that, uh, the program has moved forward and we have a daily treatment program uh, that started up earlier this year with the Ravary and Islatravir daily. And our partners at Gilead are taking forward the weekly program. The only one that is not moving forward, as I said before, is the monthly Islatravir program. So where does that leave us? Um, we still have that holistic view of what we need to to bring to the clinic. So starting with the bottom left corner, we are working on PrEP. We are still developing once monthly oral therapy. We have, we have publicly disclosed that we have a second translocation inhibitor that in fact is perhaps even a little more potent than Islatravir. It, is, it only has a number right now, MK8527. And we are working, we are trying to determine what doses may be suitable for monthly administration. And we continue to discuss whether it would be a Slatravir or this new one, 8527, that would go into an annual implant for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Moving, to, moving upwards, we have our, our daily treatment program. Of course, we have three marketed products. But we are developing, again, um, doravirine and islatravir, doravirine at the same dose of 100 milligrams and islatravir at 0.25 milligrams. And this will be both for naive and for switch patients. What we will not be doing, at least for now, is treatment experience patients, because for that, we do believe we need a higher dose. Then we have our weekly oral treatment program, and now it'll be Eslatravir Lenacapavir, and we'll come back to that question of the two milligrams in a moment. And under discussion is going forward with our own internal um, NNRTI weekly candidate, MK8507, which of course would be paired uh, with and then with a translocation inhibitor, most likely 8527, but potentially Eslatravir. And then uh, going back to this issue of ultra long acting and how do you define that? We, we also believe that 
probably more than every three months. So we're working on several different long-acting injectables. And under discussion uh, is the possibility of putting Islatravir and or 8527 into an implant along with something else that would be injected. So with that, I'll, I'll bring it to, to, a, to an end. And thank you for your attention and glad to take any questions.